Perfect. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Coming to another series of the NL ISI NL seminar. This is one of uh, one of our last ones. Um, in two weeks, we'll have our last one for this semester. But today we have Matthew Phillison, who will be giving us a talk on how to steal GP chat GPT's embedding size and other low rank logic tricks. Uh, Matthew Phillison is a PC student um, at USC. He is co-advised by uh, Swaba and Sean Ren. And um, previously, he was a pre-doctoral researcher at the Allen Institute for AI uh, after completing his bachelor's at Harvard University studying computer science and linguistics. So without further ado, let's welcome Matthew. Great, thanks Justin for the introduction. Um, great, yeah, so I'm Matt, I'm a first year PhD. This is my um, second paper that I worked on here with, and first paper with both of my advisors on it. So um, great, maybe we can just jump right in. So th this talk will have some, uh, th th this paper that I wrote uh, has some like math in it, but we're gonna try to have, I want people to understand the, the high level ideas of the math here, um, but there's not gonna be any like mathematical notation on the screen. We're gonna kind of try and do this visually. Um, and so, so hopefully, you can all follow along and, and understand how um, basically we can use the, the, the consequences of neural architecture design to uh, get accountability for API protected language model providers. <clears throat> but before that, let's talk about the, uh, the eclipse that happened recently. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I, was only able to see a partial eclipse from my house. I made a little projection. Um, but for those who were lucky enough to be the path of totality, uh, this is what they saw back on April 8th, uh, which is the moon eclipsing the sun. And if you notice here, the there's kind of a halo around the moon. This is called the solar corona. Um, and this it's not just like, it's the upper atmosphere of the sun. Uh, and it's not just a uniform atmosphere. You can see it has this structure to it. You can see kind of these rays going in different directions. So, um, so the solar corona, uh, first of all, it looks really cool. Um, it's really fun to look at. Uh, what it is, is it's this field of plasma, which are like charged particles. Um, they actually happen to be hotter than the surface of the sun, which is was kind of counterintuitive. Um, and they, they have this structure because of the magnetic field of the sun. Um, it causes these kind of fun looking things called prominences. These are big loops of charged particles that are basically trapped in the, in the sun's magnetic field. Um, so what we're gonna do, the reason I was talking about the sun is because there's kind of an, an analogy here that I'll, I'll spell out. So the sun has these internal magnetic fields that are difficult to observe from our perspective here on Earth. Uh, we, we can't go visit the sun and measure the magnetic fields, um, but scientists are able to study the structure of coronal loops uh, to, to better understand the internal magnetic fields of the sun. Similarly, uh, in, this, in this talk, we're gonna talk about how uh, the structure of language model outputs helps us or allows us to peek into the internal details of a language model. So the sun, on one hand, proprietary language models that we don't have access to. On the other hand, the magnetic field um, is the thing that we're trying to observe. For language models, it's like the, the architectural details of the model. And then the solar corona is how, we're, is how scientists say the sun. We're going to look at a, the API outputs of language models. Cool. So the... The kind of the core of this technique comes from the, the, the idea that, or the kind of the, the fact that language model outputs lie within this low dimensional Sorry. space. Um, so this, this visualization is something that we're gonna come back to a lot. It's this triangle. Um, each point within this triangle um, represents a probability distribution. So the middle here uh, represents the uniform distribution and each of these corners represents um, a distribution that puts all probability on one of the items. So this is like probability distributions over three items. Um, hopefully that makes sense to people. Um, and, and there's kind of this mathematical fact that for 
most language models, the outputs are restricted to like a, a subspace of the full output space. And we can use this to study the language model. Now, now this is um, this is different uh, from the manifold hypothesis. Um, this is the manifold hypothesis basically says that like there's there's like a low dimensional space where that, that like encapsulates more information about some task or something. This is this is just like a pure mathematical fact that that language models have to output things in a low dimensional space. So we're going to go into some of the technical details of how this works. Okay, so to put us all on the same page, uh, a transformer uh, takes an input and generates a contextualized embedding. So this is um, this is a representation of what the next word is, uh, but it's in low dimensional space. Uh, this is called the D is the, the embedding size of the language model. Um, in order to get a distribution over tokens to, to, to choose the next token in the sequence, uh, we, mul we multiply the embedding by this softmax matrix, which basically projects it linearly into a V dimensional space. V is your vocab size. So go ahead. Projection, linear projection from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional space. And then you apply the softmax function in order to get, um, convert these logits into a, a valid probability distribution. I like Taylor Swift. This is why I have to have Taylor Swift to fix here. Um, great. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the structure of the vocabulary space. Um, so Next token distributions are, you can like, we operationalize them as like tuples over reals. So it's basically each, um, each item in the tuple is a probability for that token. So the, the zeroth token gets some probability and so on. Um, so you can think about this as a vector um, over real, over like the reals. Um, but there's certain constraints on these. So one of these constraints is that a valid probability distribution has to sum to one. Um, and, and so basically, and they're also non-negative. So basically, if you look at the, the space of reals, the probability distributions are constrained to this triangle, which is what we saw before. Um, and this triangle is called the simplex. It's denoted by this uh, delta symbol. Um, and so you can think of probabilities as living on this um, on this in this space. Um, so there's kind of a, a lesser known fact, but this simplex is actually a, a vector space. Um, it has kind of the, the properties that make something a vector space. And, and because of that, the softmax function is a, is a linear map um, from the real space to, to the space of probability distributions. Um, I asked my Twitter followers if they, if, they thought, if they agreed with me on this, and most of them didn't believe me that it's a, a linear map. But if you go through and, and check, there's kind of a, a non-standard uh, definition of addition and scalar multiplication in the vector space uh, in, in, the, in the simplex. But you, you can just check the, the requirements for something to be a linear map, and softmax actually fulfills it. Um, to kind of get a sense of this, um, like if you map uh, points in RV um, into the simplex space, um, you can you can kind of there's an isomorphism. The, the softmax is an isomorphism, so you can there's an inverse map that brings them back um, into real space and basically maps. You, you basically lose one dimension. Um, basically, all the all the points along the diagonal um, will map to like a the same point. So some, some interesting facts about uh, vector spaces and the simplex. Sorry. Yes. What's CLR? Uh, that, that's the inverse of the softmax function. Oh. It's called the center log ratio transform. Uh, you don't need to know about it to understand this talk, but it's, it's useful for if you have probability distributions from a language model and you want to convert them into like the real vector space mm -hmm. so you can do vector operations on them. Cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the explanation for why language model outputs lie on a low dimensional space. So 
some vocabulary, the image of a function is its codomain or its range. It's like basically the, the points that can be output by a function. So for instance, if you have a, a linear function from RD to RV, so basically projecting to a higher dimension, the outputs will be projected onto a lower dimensional subspace of the higher dimensional space. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yes. Um, yeah, so the, the linear, the, the dimension of a linear map's image is at most the dimension, like the, the smaller dimension, um, like within that, like if, if it's from RD to RV, then the dimension of the image is at most D. Um, furthermore, if we compose the softmax function with the softmax matrix um, transformation, we get that this, because these are both linear transformations, the output will still lie within this low dimensional space. And basically, because this is the output of the, of the language model, all the outputs must pass through this linear transformation. It means that all the language model's outputs will live on this low dimensional subspace. I'm, I'm a living little bit of trouble interpreting what this shows us. Are you saying that the, the, the takeaway is that actually generating language is a lot less complex than it seems? Or like, what, what is it? What is it? I guess what this is saying is that the, um, like the expressiveness of a language model, a language model can't output any arbitrary probability, probability distribution. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's, it has to, it has to choose from this space what output it's going to generate. I see. So, so you're saying its expressivity is limited? Yeah. That's right. So I have, I think, two different questions. Um, number one, so this space is, it, it's of dimension D, which uh -huh. is usually in the several hundreds at least. So it's low dimensional relative to what? It's low dimensional relative to the size of the vocabulary. Okay. And then my second question is like, how does, um, how does this mapping like account for different decoding strategies? Like if you're not just always taking the, the highest probability token at every decoding step? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I guess actually it might be more interesting to think about what happens when you only take the, the highest probability token. So, um, so with uh, like, for instance, in this case, with this like very low dimensional language model, the, the token that's like maximized at this point will never be, will never have the most probability. It'll never, it's called like, it's unart maxable, basically. Mm -hmm. Like that token will never have the most probability. There's always some other token that will have more probability than it. Um, but when it comes to like most sampling methods, if you just sample from the language model distribution, you can, you can basically sample and you have some probability of sampling any token. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer? Yeah, I think, I think that sort of makes sense. So just to clarify the, the line in, inside of the triangle, mm -hmm. that represents the set of all probability distribution. It's not just one distribution, correct? Uh, yes, this line represents, yeah, it's a set of probability distributions. Yeah. So the possible probability distributions on their softmax that we can potentially end up at. Yeah, that's exactly right. So at each step, the, the language model has to choose something from this set to output. It can't output this probability, for instance, that's not in its output set. Is that a bad thing? Um, it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, I mean, if you have, if you have a large vocabulary, you have a much more efficient inference because you generate more text with each step. Um, and if, if language happens to all fall within this low dimensional set of probability distributions, then there's no issue. Um, my hypothesis is that it doesn't, um, but that this, this is a good enough approximation of the set of all relevant 
probability distributions that it's fine. This is an argument that the capacity of larger models is, is a little bit wasteful. Um, the capacity of large models, because uh -huh. the capacity of a language model could theoretically um, model more probability distributions in that simplex, but like the, the choice of D and B might constrain the actual observed distributions to like a smaller part of the simplex. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and actually, I think it's with, with smaller models, this problem is often worse because they you often have the same size vocabulary as the large models, um. but they have a smaller hidden size. So the discrepancy between dimensions is larger. Um, but yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. So I was thinking the other way around. So if you match D to be V, mm -hmm. let's say you don't have any computational constraints, you have all the computation in the world. And if you train a model where D equals V, then does this not become a problem anymore because there's no compression. You're never going into a lower dimensional space. Yeah, that's always... right. Okay. That's exactly right. So if, if you, if you, like, yeah, if you had a small vocabulary, the same size of your mm -hmm. hidden size, then not an issue at all. And actually this whole, um, yeah, like this, this whole uh, thing that I did with finding ChatGPT's hidden size wouldn't be, well, one wouldn't be relevant because you know it from knowing the vocabulary size. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th th this technique wouldn't work. Well, thanks for those awesome questions. Um, so let's move on to consequences of knowing the language model's image. Um, well, actually, before we get to this, one, one more note. So because the, the output space is this low dimensional space, you can actually figure out exactly what this space is by collecting outputs from the model. So if you collect D outputs from the model, they will form a basis for this low dimensional space. So for instance, if you if you collect, in this case, the hidden size is just, the hidden dimension is just one. So if you just collect, if you just collect like a single output, you know that all the other outputs from the language model will be a scaled version of that one output. So by, by querying the, the API enough times, you can figure out exactly what the image of the language model is, what this output space is. And this has some consequences. So, so for one, um, like you can use output, like full outputs from a language model in order to like steal um, like the language model in theory. Um, and so like, the like theoretically these companies have some uh some motivation to keep this a secret um so how do we now i'm going to go over like how we get um language model outputs so uh so usually an api like open ai's api just gives you the top k tokens um and their and their probabilities um but they also have this interface called logit bias, where you can um, add a bias term to the logits before applying the softmax and get those biased log props out of the out of the model. So by by sequentially adding bias to, to different sets of tokens and boosting them to the top k, you can figure out um, basically what the what the probability on each um, token in the vocabulary is. So. Um, so in order, like using this technique, you can you can basically find a full output, like a full distributional output from the language model in V over K calls, basically like by, by doing this batched uh, query strategy. Um, but once you know the, the image of the language model, um, once you get the first D probabilities out of the model, you can solve for the, the rest of the probabilities because it's in this low dimensional space. Basically the, the output is defined by, like once you know the first D entries, you know what the rest will be. Um, yeah, so, so basically, um, so what this means is once you, if you spend the, the initial money to, to get this language model image, from then on, it becomes much cheaper by like multiple orders of magnitude potentially uh, in order to 
steal the model, for instance, or, or do other like adversarial attacks. Uh, so quick question. First of all, what's the initial motivation of prov providing logic bias? So is that, for example, for safety concerns that, for example, you want, like if you want to push the model to be like more polite, like give more uh, probability to, so my question is for, like, why do they provide legit bias in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think the use case that they have on their website is like for like banning certain tokens. If okay. you don't want it to talk about rabbits, okay. you can put like a negative bias on rabbits. Got it. And uh, when you say extracting full output takes, uh, this means API calls. It means that in each batch, you you select k items from the vocabulary and like pushes it to uh, put high basically make them the top k and mm -hmm. you retrieve the probabilities for those and then you have a way to know what the initial probabilities were for these k items that resulted in this and then you do that for v over k times to do it for all the vocabulary that's exactly right okay so how do you avoid saturating that logic transform so that you know, there is a period where a, a place where you couldn't recover if you boosted too much right um so when you boost, so you, you select K tokens and you put high bias on those tokens, and you don't put bias on any of the other tokens. Um, like if I put infinite bias on some token, right, then I'm not gonna be able to recover its, its initial probability. And so infinite infinity is like an yeah. edge case, but you kind of have to choose that bias so that you can recover the probability so that it doesn't saturate the transform, right? Oh, I see. So you're worried about uh, saturation. Um, I, because they're, we're working with log probs, um, it's, you can, so, so there's a natural limit that if guy doesn't let you put more than a hundred bias on any one token. Um, and what we find is that uh, at that level, it doesn't saturate. And for the vast majority of distributions, that's enough to put that token in the top K and still be able to numerically recover the original probability. Yeah. Okay, so the the kind of the second consequence or, or application um, is that we can we can find the dimension of the of like the, the hidden dimension of the model. Um, so basically, the way the way you do this is you you collect at least d outputs from the model, put them in a matrix, and then just um, check the dimensionality of that matrix. Um, and the way you check the dimensionality is you check the non-zero singular values. So basically, um, if the columns of a matrix span a d-dimensional space, then there will be d, that, that matrix will have d non-zero um, singular values. So to, to kind of prove this method, we, we did this with some open source models um, and showed that Basically, if you plot the singular values of the outputs, there's like a, a large drop at the dimensionality of the model. Um, and so this was kind of it was kind of cool to see. And then we um, we did this querying uh, attack on GPT 3.5 Turbo, um, and we saw again this this sudden drop in singular values. Um, we found. Our estimate was for, for the hidden size was 4,600. That was kind of like the point where it actually dropped. Um, we're not sure exactly if the model actually has that size or it has the more conventional size of 4096. It's possible that there were like corruptions in the output that would basically, if you collect um, like a bogus log prog, then it increases your dimensionality by one. So if if there was a certain percentage of the outputs had uh, like bogus stuff on it, uh, like a bogus entry, then we would get this like um, off by 500 error. Is there, I mean, the sampling protocol here, um, is that a, a possible issue here that you'd get a lower dimensionality just because, you know, you might always sample instances which are in a lower dimensional subspace 
Uh, and so you wouldn't be able to see all of the, the, the D-dimensional subspace. You just see a region of it. And then if you asked about like code or automotive repair or something that's like in a different domain, you'd see some different spot part of that, that distribution. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, you're saying like, what if there are two probability distributions that are like uh, just scaled versions of each other or something? Maybe more like, let's say all of the language models outputs from your probe set fall in the subspace of the d-dimensional so but mm -hmm. when you actually do this estimation you're only seeing the subspace not the full space because of the way you've chosen the samples yeah that's a great question so to try to mitigate that we like collected way more than sure. 4096 um so I think just statistically speaking it's very unlikely it just happens to be very unlikely that these um, that you collect a subspace, um, but that, that's a good that's a good point. Like that is kind of a risk that we just kind of assumed wasn't going to be a problem. Um, just because we're working with numbers, it's very hard to get those to align exactly. Um, um, if, but following up on that question, like there are ensemble methods or like speculative decoding methods where like smaller models are used for some tokens and larger models are used for other tokens. You do kind of have a mixture of spaces being introduced in the generation mm. process, right? Yeah, yeah. So in that case, it would depend on what model is giving you the log props. Are you getting the log props from the smaller model or the bigger model? Um, and that can change depending on your token generation, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So. Yeah, it's possible that 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 could also have been um, like a factor in, in our like. We think that it's not actually four hundred, four thousand six hundred. We think it's more likely four ninety six. So maybe that's another explanation. Exactly. So um, another kind of consequence of knowing a model's image is that this this model image kind of acts as a unique signature for that model. So, so to show this, what we did is we we chose a, a checkpoint from uh, one of the Pythia models, uh, not its final checkpoint, but maybe one of its it's one of its intermediate uh, checkpoints, and we generated an output from that model, and then we took the um, the images from basically the output spaces for all the checkpoints of the model and checked for each one is was the output in the image for all the other checkpoints. Um, the way you do that is you just do kind of a least squares regression and see, could this model have generated this output? And what we found is that the, the output from Pythia 70 million, the 1,000 or 1 1.2 times 10 to the fifth, uh, that, that checkpoint, um, like the output from that checkpoint lies very uniquely with uh, in the output space of that model. So even just like one checkpoint over, there's no way that like, for instance, this model could not have generated the output from this model. So these, these, uh, these output spaces change fairly quickly during training. Um, and it's very unlikely that they match up uh, with each other at different points in, in training. Uh, and this is true across different checkpoints of the same model and also different versions or different sizes of the same model. Um, and the reason this is useful is that it can actually be a tool for accountability. So let's say AGI Inc. comes out with this new language model API, um, but they wanted to save money, so they didn't actually train their own language model, they just serve one with two. Um, but they don't want it to make it obvious, they changed their homework a little bit, so catches them cheating, they add this little hidden prompt to the model that so that the, the logits will never exactly match up with, um, like if you just checked if they match the logits of your own llama 2 model. But we can actually still catch ATI Inc. for their nefarious behavior um, by just checking, is the image the same? Because the image won't change even if you change the prompt. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting, um, situation where you, you can kind of hold language model providers accountable uh, for, for their behavior. But this is based on the assumption that AGI would provide some logins to their or Yeah, if, 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 well, actually they don't need to provide, they don't actually need to provide log props because there's ways of, of deducing the log props. They, what they need to provide is logit bias. 
So if they decide not to provide those bias, it'll be a lot harder to catch them. I mean, if I were AJ, you could stochastically generate a logit bias for every token and change that for every, uh, right? And then you would be, then the image would be different, right? Yeah, so if they just randomly generated like some noise to add to it. Yeah. Well, interestingly there, you would see that their hidden dimension would be like their vocab size, which would be suspicious in a different way, but you wouldn't yeah, be able yeah. to do this fingerprinting. You just kind of see like, okay, you know, yeah, so this isn't this isn't a, a foolproof way of, of catching, but if it, it kind of relies on them not knowing about this. So I think I think the result of this is like is it, this isn't like a, like a way of this isn't like a zero knowledge proof of what model you have, um, but it's something that if you wanted to do something bad, you should consider. <laughs> Um, cool. So another thing that you, that a question? Yeah, um, and it may be more appropriate later in the talk, so feel free to defer it. So does this, does this have utility for detecting whether a specific piece of text is LLM generated? Like if I want to know whether ChatGPT wrote this person's homework, if the homework is in ChatGPT's image, is that meaningful or is it, you know, just likely that a human can also write that text? Yeah, that's a great question. So for this particular method, it requires having the full like probability distribution over tokens, um, which you can't really get from text. Um, but if you have the language model's image, you might be able to see certain linear dependencies between token probabilities. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually interested in developing a method to try to, it's like a natural watermark maybe on the language model's outputs. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. <laughs> cool. So um, another way that you can try to hold language model API providers accountable is understanding what types of changes that they're making to their model. So for instance, like kind of the base case is if the if the logits of the model never change and the image of the model never changes, then of course the model stays the same. Um, but there's certain cases, for instance, if the, if the logits change, but the image doesn't change, you know that they've done something kind of not, they haven't done a full fine tune or full model update. They've kept the, the output layer the same, uh, which could indicate maybe they changed like a hidden prompt, like a system message or something for the model, um, or they have done some kind of partial fine tuning at some other layer that didn't affect the, the output layer. Um, Another thing you could do is you could see if the new image uh, can be produced using a low rank update uh, to, the, to, to the image parameters. Um, so this is kind of an interesting way. Uh, we don't actually work out the details of how you would, you basically have to decompose the image into like the, into like a low rank update. Uh, but it's, it's kind of an interesting direction that you could go with this. Uh, and then, of course, if the image changes, it means that they've changed the model, uh, including the output layer. Um, some other uses that we, we came up with uh, were, as I mentioned before, you can automatically find unarged taxable tokens. So if the model will never output a certain token because it will never have the most probability on it, um, you can like find those tokens. And these are basically like unutterable tokens that the model has. Uh, like you can say repeat after me and then say the, that unargmaxable token and the model will probably generate a different token. It's like a, it's kind of like a bug in the model. Um, you could try to actually recover the softmax matrix, matrix itself up to some kind of rotation. Uh, and then finally, um, my previous paper, I came up with a sampling method that basically tries to anticipate where models make errors um, when predicting next token uh, probabilities. And you could, um, knowing it's sufficient to know the model's image uh, in order to implement that uh, sampling method. So um, around the same time that we released this paper, like a couple of days before, someone else released a, a very similar paper. They had a, um, this was hardly me at all. Um, basically they, they, they came up with the same, the same technique for figuring out what the, the hidden size of the model is, but 
their conclusion was basically this doesn't really have much they, they don't they said that basically we don't know of any practical uses of this information um i think we would argue that there are actually lots of, of uses for this information um and so uh it was actually cool to see like some of the uh very cool to see some of the techniques that they came up with for trying to uh, solve for the, the like the softmax matrix. Um, so they came at it from more of a like a model stealing perspective, um, and and we showed some like other uses. For instance, getting cheap outputs from from the language model. Cool. So um, let's see. What's my do I have time? Yeah. I don't want to leave plenty of time for questions, but uh, we, we consider a few ways that uh, API providers could defend against these types of attacks. So one thing that someone mentioned was we can, like, uh, API provider can stop giving top K log props. Um, and we actually show in our paper that this only will slow down attacks. So it becomes like, uh, instead of O of V over K, it's O of v over k times like log epsilon, where epsilon is the uh, the precision with which you want to get the log props. Basically, you can do a binary search by adding logit bias until a token becomes the top token, and then subtract bias, or, and then basically like do a, a binary search until you find within a certain precision um, the, the log prop of the token. Um, the other thing that the, the language model provider could do is train a model that doesn't have a softmax bottleneck. So you could change to a smaller vocabulary model. Um, there's there's a number, or you could have an output layer that doesn't have this linear constraint on it. Uh, and then probably the the most the easiest thing to do would just be, as you said, discontinue the logic bias. Um, Presumably, logit bias is helpful for people who are using the API. So this would be this might make some people unhappy, um, but there might be other ways that a provider could like appease these people by maybe um, just like banning certain. Um, but like, like instead of using a bias, they could just like have some other mechanism for banning tokens. Um, interestingly. OpenAI, in response to the other paper that came out just before ours, um, decided to, they didn't discontinue top K log probs, but they basically made it so that the top K log probs were not the biased top K log probs. They were just the vanilla. Basically, the logit bias wasn't added to the, the log probs. Um, so that would kind of correspond to this, um, this first option. Uh, so it's not actually a foolproof attack. It just makes the attack more expensive. So at the end of the day, we actually looked at kind of the, the dangers <laughs> of, of people getting their hands on the model images. And we, our, our take is that um, like these images are useful for model accountability. They build trust between users and providers. And so, and they don't actually really enable these attacks. Um, like they make them cheaper, but they're still quite expensive. So we actually think that language model providers should actually embrace this vulnerability, which I think is more of a feature than a bug. Um, yeah, so some, some future directions that, that I'm interested in, in taking this is um, like different attack models. So if they take away logic bias, are there other ways that we could recover the, the model image? Um, how can we expand these auditing methods that we came up with? Um, and then is it possible to move beyond the output layer? For instance, the layer norm, uh, which presumably is the second to last layer, um, has its own kind of bottleneck properties. Uh, could we use the same techniques to figure out what the parameters of the layer norm are? And then so on, maybe figure stuff out about the whole model. So thank you all for coming. Um, just to review, I have some points up here so you can remember some of your questions from earlier. And um, yeah, thank you all so much.
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Do we have questions for the audience, both online and in person? Um, let's see how you're just talking. Okay. Um, yeah, if, online audience, if you have a question, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering, I think I have a high level understanding of, of the work that you've done. Um, you wouldn't happen to have like an example to walk through with where you have a top eight output and then, I don't know, influencing a logic bias, adjust the um, output somehow, and then that gives you some kind of... Yeah, I can show you actually the math from the paper um, for, for uh, how that works. Okay. Um, so you want, you want to see the process of going from the biased logic output mm -hmm. to the unbiased log problem? Yes, but like I think I, if you can just direct me to the paper, then I'll take that or something because I feel like maybe it's uh, too much. Okay. Uh, yeah. For the time being, but yeah. Um, can you explain that figure uh, a little better? The one with the big with the Pythia deduped and Pythia, and then the yeah the big drop. Like, what is? Can you just say again, like what the one point two drop is and what that's showing us? Yeah. So each of these points. Um, is a model or like a checkpoint of a model. Yeah. So, so the checkpoint that generated the output was this checkpoint. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Sorry, so you, you, you have a single text string that that point generated. Okay, gotcha. Well, it's actually not a text string. It's a it's a distribution over vocabulary items. I see it, I see it. And then you're, you've are you built a model to assign the checkpoint of the specific model to that probability distribution. Yeah, it's, it's less of a model and just like a check. So basically you have this probability distribution and you say, is this probability distribution in the output space of this model? And the way you check that is you just do a least squares regression. So you do like the, the output space times some x equals this probability distribution. Find the least squares solution to that. Um, if it's, and then you check the residual of that solution. And if the, the residual is large, it means that the output isn't really in that model's image. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see a hand up. Yeah. So there's only one model checkpoint that was able to match the distribution and none of the other checkpoints. Before or after, you mean the distribution changed? Um, yeah, so so the the distribution that I'm checking is the one generated by this model, and it's held constant. The thing that's changing is the the model. Yeah, yeah. So so that's exactly. So right. only one checkpoint that matched mm -hmm. the distribution you're looking for. Yeah. And yeah, it's because it it was generated by that model. I sort of have to watch it, but we also have a one-on-one, -on -one, so I can say one word. But like regarding this, um, the fact that like you, uh, like I know, like checkpoints can be closer and further apart. But like if we look at how this signifies the model image changes during training, like if you like with the simple triangle and the curved line, mm -hmm. how this curved line is moving in this triangle and how have you like, first of all, I'm interested to see if we can look at that and are there anything to learn from that, that how yeah, the that's... model image is evolving or like why is making this choice to move towards this image rather than the other? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. So this is something I've been thinking about a little bit. So like, I think one of the reasons that this test is so sensitive is because even if the model image changes by just like a tiny amount, the amount of overlaps between two planes mm -hmm. is always small, no matter whether they're like very close in angle or very like different in angle. So um, I think that might be part of the reason that it, it's so sensitive. I think it'd be really interesting to look at the the angle between these hyperplanes um, to see like how quickly does that angle change from step to step. Um, that might be a better way of like maybe assigning ancestry to a model like oh you, it has this image and you can see that it it's like close in angle to this other model. We think that that was like it was like fine-tuned from that previous model. 
I, it's, I think like this, this, this might be too sci-fi, but I think, do you think like, uh, because you can start from the same checkpoint and using different training data, different kinds of training data and end up at different checkpoints. So it's, uh, this might be also useful to see. What training data was used? Did they use like New York Times and like also like watermarking from that perspective to yeah. not let them use your data if you don't want to? Yeah, yeah. And that would, that would also really go well with this theme of accountability. Like, can we look at the way that the model image changes um, to identify what, what data was trained on? I think that I. I don't. I don't know if it's too sci-fi. I've I've been thinking a lot about that actually myself. Um, still haven't decided whether it's too sci-fi or not. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely discuss more in one-on-one. -on -one. Really yeah. Exciting. Yeah. So this is actually one of the things I was talking about with Willie. Um, so Willie's involved in this LLM three hundred and sixty project, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of checkpoints, three hundred and sixty of them, I believe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it might be interesting to to see if we could use that um, to, to study this. I can't say like I, there's previous research projects I've done that that I've really wished that I had access to the full distribution. Like uh, there was a contrasted decoding project and it was like, oh, we really wish we could do this with GPT models, but we just don't have the, the whole logic distribution or like any classification task where you actually want probabilities associated with each class. And, you want to use the language model for that. So yeah, I think this is having a low cost way to calculate the whole distribution is useful, not even in the context of inferring things about the model itself, but for just use cases. Mm. Yeah, actually as part of this project, I contributed uh, like a pull request to this library called Open Log Probs. Um, oh. That's from Jack Morris at Cornell. Um, yeah, that's, I can point you to that, but that's, there's like a, a library. It's still under development oh, cool. for, for extracting these from APIs. Sweet. Do you, do you think it's possible to get some sort of um, like confidence interval over the, you know, the size you're trying to estimate that, um, you know, shrinks as you get towards that number that you, that you know you need at the end, but, but when, when you're still underspecified in terms of the number of, uh, you know, calls you've made to the, to the API, you have some sort of, less than zero information, some confidence interval over the thing you want to estimate, or is it that impossible? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Because you know, for instance, like some of the probabilities. So basically, if you know that the rest of them are in this low dimensional space, yeah, I think you, I think you could. Um, and you also have bounds on them because you know what the top probability tokens are. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting idea. We can get a ballpark with much fewer or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that would be a really interesting application of this. Awesome. Um, so I think we had a bunch of questions, and I don't think I see any on uh, Zoom. So I think we can um, end the talk today here. Um, so let's see.